So in this video, I'm going to be talking to a representative from the Queensland Department of Main Roads and Transport about the new GVM and GCM laws. Adam Shaw, thank you very much for joining me. Um, could you just please give us a brief introduction of your background, please, and your role in TMR? So I'm a re registered professional engineer in Queensland. Uh, I'm principal engineer with the Vehicle Standards Unit for the Department of Transport and Main Roads up in Queensland. Right, so let's get into the questions then. So the, the new GCM and GVM laws, can you just give a bit of a background as to why these codes were developed and what the problem is um, that is being solved with them? Certainly. So back in 2018, uh, the Commonwealth Government released uh, an administrator's circular, it was 046 at the time, uh, that basically laid out the reasons that they don't certify a gross combination mass or assess a gross combination mass increase under their second stage manufacturer. This was again uh, reaffirmed back in 2019. Um, obviously through their, like I say, the second stage of manufacturer approvals for modifications pre-registration. Now, alongside that, there was no way under either the National Code of Practice for Vehicle Modifications or the Queensland Code of Practice for Vehicle Modifications to allow for re-rating of gross combination mass. Now, we had in place already um, at the code up here in Queensland to allow for gross vehicle mass uh, increases. Um, and obviously, as you've seen over, over the years, the, the sizes of trailers, particularly caravans, have increased in both size and mass and the amount that they actually weigh. Um, and we've had continued calls from industry and also the towing community to put in place some kind of code that allows for the re-rating of this, this, this function. Okay. So what was the process of development and who was involved? How long did it take and, and how did it go to come up with this GCM upgrade code? So there was a, uh, originally there was a, a, a working group put together by the Australian uh, Automotive or Aftermarket Accessories Association um, to put a proposal together based on one known international standard to allow for this to happen. Uh, a lot of their members had... Um, were interested in undertaking this type of modification. So we, we reviewed the, um, and that was way back in the day, that was back in, um, just as soon as this cl clarification was made from the Commonwealth Government as well. So this working group gave us a proposal, uh, myself and my jurisdictional peers and uh, engineering colleagues where I work, we reviewed what the proposal was uh, and decided that, you know, it was time to put something together in the similar vein that there is for a heavy vehicle code that allows this operation. Okay. So it had quite a bit of industry consultation then um, over, through this process. Absolutely, yeah. So there were, there were probably on the lines of um, 10 to 15 interested parties as part of this technical working group that the AAAA set up. Um, and they've had input all the way along. So we've had quite a, a cordial relationship with with both the industry peak body and these uh, entities on the, the technical working group to understand their needs, but also to obviously make sure that we come up with a robust code that um, it, it is safe to implement. Yeah. And I guess part of that safety is the J2807 test, isn't it? That's correct, yes. Yep. So the majority of the code is is, is based upon that um, that international standard. Obviously, it's a federal standard, but it, it's the only one that exists around the world, so that's the one we've used as the baseline for our code. Yeah, and but new vehicles don't need to comply with that, do they? Yeah. Uh, it's just the aftermarket modifications. Uh, this is part of it, yes. So this is an in-service code specifically um, related to the Queensland Code of Practice currently. Yeah. Okay. So one um, concern people have is will existing GCM or GVM modifications be invalidated? I've not seen anything to suggest that's the case, but um, I'm going to ask the question anyway. Yeah. So we currently up here in Queensland, we have the LS11 code, which is the gross vehicle mass upgrade. Um, all vehicles that have been certified under 
uh, that modification code will still remain. That, that doesn't change because obviously this, this new code, the LS16 code, um, is for a different operation. So all those vehicles that have been previously modified under that code, they're, they're still valid. Um, in, in Queensland, we, we've not recognised GCM. We've always been clear about that along the way, that GCM is not, um, it does not function as part of the LS11 code, which is just purely related to the gross vehicle mass upgrade. Okay, so basically, if you've got a modified vehicle, then it, it can stay modified. It's not suddenly become going to become made illegal. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Good. Now, um, if we've got a non-separate chassis vehicle, because the code is specifically separate chassis vehicle, can you upgrade the GVM on that to that of an equivalent model? So, for example, um, the Pajero from 2000 onwards, the NM series onwards, they have different GVMs. It's fundamentally the same vehicle, but that's probably arguably not a separate chassis. It's monocoque. And that also begs the question, what actually is a separate chassis vehicle versus a monocoque? Because every monocoque vehicle has a has a sub-chassis. Yeah. So currently within the Queensland Code of Practice, only body-on-frame style vehicles are allowed to have a GVM upgrade performed on them and um, that's based on um, a lot of previous information that was uh, put together when we first started designing that code. Uh, a lot of these are based on the engineering calculations surrounding a body on frame chassis are, are a lot um, simpler to undertake than analysing a full or all the torsional twist and all, all stiffness of a monocoque vehicle. So that's why that's been limited as such so far. Um, is that something that we look at in the future? Um, that, that may be part of the ongoing code maintenance, but currently it's just limited to body on frame vehicles. Okay. Um, I can understand that if you're going to re-rate um, a vehicle to a higher GVM, but let's say you've got a Pajero or let's say one of the Land Rovers and it's a GVM of let's say three tons and another um, one of exactly the same model is 3100. The only difference is it's got seven seats or a different engine. It's fundamentally the same. Couldn't we just re-rate the, um, the lower one to the higher one because it's all the same underpinnings? Um, I actually d did have some discussions with the engineers at Land Rover on this, and uh, that there are some more intricacies in in the setup on the vehicles for the different GVMs. So um, uh, currently, as we stand, uh, that's that's not part of the work scope for the for the code at the moment. Okay. Now, how does the 110% GVM upgrade rule work? So I did read the regulations on that, and I wasn't quite clear what needed to be done. At um, and how a 110% upgrade GVM would differ from a other type of GVM upgrade. It seemed to be less onerous in terms of, I guess, the evidence package. Could you just talk us through that, please? Yes. So the, um, for the obviously in-service registered vehicles in Queensland, uh, the 110% rule uh, limits the amount of vehicle can have the GVM increased by, and that, that, that's set at that limit. Um, obviously, an engineer will assess a vehicle and look at the condition, what parts are put on. And this, this is open to any body on frame vehicle to have that 110%. Um, so, for example, and that can be done by a, a TMR proof person engineer. Um, so, for example, for a vehicle with an arbitrary number 3300 kilogram GVM, they can have 330 kilogram GVM upgrade performed on it. Okay. Um, so how would that differ from going beyond 110%? Well, we, we, we d decided to make a limit at that because then there's no, there's no age limit for the vehicles that can be done. It's just dependent on conditions. So there are a lot of older vehicles that still want to carry, the owners still want to carry more more weight and more stuff in their vehicle. Um, and th this was the reason why that limit was um, put down as a, a safety measure to ensure that the vehicles are done correctly and modified correctly. Um, they're slightly different when there is another pathway which allows you based on um, the second stage of manufacturer, but a lot of the second stage of manufacturers approvals that come out of the federal government are for late model vehicles. And they're obviously um, over time, these vehicles have, have obviously 
established in, the, in, in their architecture in the fact that they are now stronger, for lack of a better word, shall we say, more durable, that type of thing. So, so this is where we thought that was a good baseline for us to, to have it. Um, there, there is a facility within um, that somebody can apply to us that for a modification outside of a cone, and it will be assessed by the engineers. Um, but at the moment, that, that's the limit that we've put down. Okay. All right. So you're saying that no GVM can be increased beyond 110%? Of, of, a, of a baseline vehicle and for all vehicles. If there are other pathways within the code that allow different measures, so you can go beyond that, but that's based on other, other areas. So, for example, the addition of a, 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 a third axle, for example. Oh, okay. Okay or based on a thing. There, there are different pathways in the code. So um, I, I recommend that people, if they are interested in this type of thing, they, they, yeah. they get onto our website and look for the code. It's, it's readily available. You just search it up on, under the Queensland Code of Practice and all the pathways are, are documented within that and they can read those. Uh, they can also then approach us if need be to for clarification. Yeah, I, I, I did have a read of that and uh, maybe it's just me, but I, I, I didn't quite follow all the different pathways there. So let, let, me, let me just recap my understanding and if I can do that. So um, you're saying that any separate chassis vehicle can go to 110% of GVM subject to the engineering checks and so forth that the axles yep. are strong enough, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and an evidence package has to be good for that. Beyond 110%, you've got to go further and it's got to be something like a third axle or something like that. Or based on other types of evidence. Ah, okay, so so beyond 110%, you need even more, a uh, stronger evidence package um, than um, what you would need for less than 110%. So it might be that, for example, the, the, I think the second pathway in the code is the based on a second stage manufacturer. Now, all the information would have been provided to the Commonwealth Government to secure that SSM approval. Yeah. and and then that information can then be provided as part of your LS11 code. Okay. So let's say that we had someone who's got a 300 series or something like, like that. We could fairly easily take that or a range or DMAX or whatever else to 110%, fairly standard G GVM upgrade process. Beyond that, we're looking at a new level of evidence and engineering. Yes, potentially, yes. Yep. Okay, all right, um, which may or may not involve a, um, a third axle, but or potentially some other. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily have to have a third axle, but those are that. That is one of the pathways as well. Okay, so so what tests would there be? Different tests a vehicle which is above one hundred and ten percent needs to pass, as opposed to one below one hundred and ten percent. Would the tests the same? Um, that that's up to the certifying approved person uh, obviously we can't write a specific test procedure for the gvm because there's, there's just too many factors that are involved in in the gvm um, and too many different vehicles so that's what you pay for when you engage a, an approved person engineer to upgrade the gvm on a vehicle but so that they, that they will come up with the details to to understand exactly what's going on in the system okay. there but wouldn't there need to be tests like braking, swerve tests, and things like like that? There are, and and the code the code dictates what the performance metrics are, um, it, or, or it tells you um, these things need to be taken into account when you do uh, a test. Then that's up to the engineer to devise which specific tests and evidence that he provides for to to certify the vehicle. Oh right, okay. So the requirements. What wouldn't a requirement be braking? So in other words, you've kind of got to do a braking test and you've got to do a swerve test. and um, th Those are requirements, aren't they, to pass a GVM upgrade? Yeah. Well, if you, if you look at braking, at the end of the day, even with a modification, after a modification, the legislation states that the vehicle must meet, still may continue to comply with the Australian design rules. Hmm. So now the Australian design rules, there's obviously a, a, a load of braking requirements under the ADRs that still have to be met after the modification. So okay. all those re all those requirements are in those ADRs, and then the, the approved person engineer can, can can go through that and make sure all the correct tests have been done. Okay. Now the J two eight oh seven spec um, requires the vehicles to drive up through Davis Dam. We don't 
have Davis Dam in Australia, it's a bit hard to get over. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are some of the equivalents? Could, for example, you tow a trailer with a dyno on it, which replicates the um, the drag effect of going up Davis Dam at a certain temperature, that sort of thing? That's, that's exactly correct, yeah. There, there are two ways that the code allows us to do that. Um, and obviously that is um, based on the 2807 procedure. One of those is the use of a towing dynamometer. Uh, a lot of the major manufacturers here in Australia before the shutdown of the uh, domestic industry utilize those to, uh, to simulate the towing requirements. And what a towing dynamometer does is it adds a load in the form of braking to an axle that you're towing on a trailer and will simulate um, the real world conditions on a flat surface as you would be driving up a, an incline, which is a Davis Dam. Uh, the alternatives is that we've allowed in, within the code is a, a fixed, fully programmable dynamometer uh, within a temperature controlled ch chamber to replicate the uh, temperatures required for the Davis Dam test. And if it's programmed, you can pro it does the same sort of thing, but it's obviously on a fixed system rather than on a towing dyne. Yeah. Okay. Now, can you use parts from another model to upgrade your vehicle? For example, um, you've got a Nissan Patrol um, coil. Um, the Leaf versions in the Utes can take significantly more, and then you can claim that as a OEM level um, upgrade because you're not using any parts which um, weren't yeah. already um, supplied by the manufacturer. Um, it's quite a complex. Um, procedure so it does also depend on whether there's any other codes that are required such as um, you would need to code for brakes uh, replacement axle all that sort of stuff and that's what the approved person engineer will undertake as part of their work program to certify the modification um, th there's as long as it fits within a code um, and there, there's there's an application to do that there's no reason why you cannot do those types of modifications but obviously that's the engineer's job is to understand exactly where the brakes relate to where the axle relates to then what can we do with regard to the gvm etc uh, etc et just to make sure that the, the everything is modified to the code of practice that we uh, put out okay. and the gcm upgrades and gvm upgrades be done at pre and post registration um well we there's there's no provision to upgrade um, pre-registration. This is the information we receive from the, the Commonwealth. Um, and that's why, we do, that's why we've done this code because obviously there's so much demand for it. So currently within Queensland, uh, post-registration, you, you can upgrade through the LS16 modification code. Okay. So if you do post-registration, um, going off the way GVM upgrades work, that would mean that if you have the vehicle upgraded in Queensland, that's not going to be valid for any other state if the vehicle is re-registered in that state. Yeah, obviously, obviously other jurisdictions, they handle um, their modification scheme uh, as they handle them and they manage them. It, it's, it's Sometimes there are some differences, sometimes there are some similarities. Um, they, somebody would need to contact, obviously, the other jurisdiction to find out exactly how they manage it. Um, we, I, unfortunately, I can only comment on what Queensland does, but uh, you know, th this is why we've obviously developed these codes of practices uh, within Queensland, because obviously there's such a huge demand for it, and we want a way of um, enabling TMR as a, as a regulator to, to be able to sort of ensure that there's a continued compliance in the marketplace. Okay, so to reverse it, if a vehicle was um, post-registration GVM upgraded in, say, Victoria, which is possible at the moment, and sold into Queensland, Queensland would not accept that GVM upgrade unless it was rebated according to Queensland rules. Is that correct? Um, there, there, there is an opportunity. We do do a reciprocal registration uh, operations on some vehicles so people will apply to us to look at what they've had done pr previously and uh, mm -hmm. we will assess it and then we can make a decision on that yeah. and advise the cust customer accordingly uh, sometimes they may need uh, to visit a, a queensland approved person other times they may not okay but it's, so, it's all, all dependent on the modification that's been undertaken. yeah um, but, but but it's not it's not an automatic thing is thing is what you're saying there it needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis 
Correct, yes. Yeah. And so if we apply the same logic to GCM upgrades, um, if somebody upgraded their GCM in Queensland and then sold that vehicle to someone outside of the, the state, um, chances are that state would say, well, we don't know what what this is. Um, we need to register. And I recognise you cannot speak for other states and not... not mm not um, yeah. asking you to, um, but that working on that logic backwards, that seems to me to be the case. Uh, it, it's likely that that may be the case. Yeah, okay. Now, um, then we come to a question of not selling the vehicle into another state and driving it into another state. So let's take the reverse example here. Let's say that someone had a um, GVM upgrade in New South Wales and then they drove into Queensland. Now that GVM upgrade hasn't been certified by the Queensland authorities, etc. Is that car still legal to drive in Queensland? Yeah, absolutely. Um where a vehicle is registered in another jurisdiction and it has a, a modification, either plate or certificate to justify that modification within that jurisdiction, Queensland will uh, recognise that vehicle um, in whatever configuration that it, it comes into. Um, obviously, with a, with a vehicle, um, there is still an opportunity if the vehicle un looks unsafe or is behaving unsafe that any authorised officer can intercept that vehicle and be, it can be subject to compliance activities yeah of course so then if we if we then reverse that logic and say someone's had a gcm upgrade in queensland um the other states would allow that vehicle to be driven on their roads legally in exactly the same way you've you've described but that's different from reselling that vehicle into that state and re-registering it in that state that's the distinction i want to draw yes that's that's exactly correct the um uh other jurisdictions recognise uh, Queensland's rules, and uh, well, as long as that vehicle is registered in that state, then those modifications are recognised. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, what is in an evidence package and a design package, and what's the difference between the two, and what what are these packages? So, the, the design package is, if you if you think about the engineering operation that's going to happen to the vehicle, is all the design codes, the bill of materials, the specification of the the parts that are going into that modification to in, ensure that this, this vehicle is capable of sustaining this type of modification. Now, the evidence package then is it's slightly different because then it encompasses both the design package as well as the validation and certification activities and test reports that come out to ensure that, one, I put the right parts in, uh, for example, I've done the right calculations, I've then done the validation of a physical test to show that the evidence is, is correct and the, and the modification can proceed. Okay, thank you. Now, um, if you've got a trailer of, let's say, ATM of 3,000 kilograms and it actually only weighs 1,000 kilograms, can you legally tow it with a vehicle which is only rated to 1,500 kilograms? Yes, you can. So th this is a common question we get asked. So on to a case study now. Someone says, I'm in Queensland and have just bought a Ram 2500. Its GVM has been reduced down to 4490 kilograms, so it can be driven in Australia without a truck licence which the cutoff is 4,500 kilograms. So as the GVM is greater overseas, can that simply be re-rated to the original overseas GVM? Well, we'd still need an approved person engineer holding the LS11 modification code to go through the design and evidence package to ensure that the vehicle is capable of that. And they will just check things. Um, it should be a very simple operation in that because the vehicle was already certified by the original equipment manufacturer for those ratings that not many things may need changing. Uh, the engineer would still need to look at, for example, just ensure that the brake requirements are the same compared to the federal standards in the US um, and, that, and that type of thing, just to ensure that it's, it's fully compliant for the uh, Australian market. Uh, and then they can perform that modification. Uh, obviously, it should be noted that once a vehicle goes into the heavy sphere, and it is subject to the licensing registration requirements as well. Okay. Right. And I guess that would cover another question, which is um, 
saying we've got a 2023 Amarok, which is sister vehicle to the Ranger, but with a different GCM um, or, or GVM. Uh, could you just reuse the Ranger? And in fact, the, the new Ranger is a good example because Ford's got a range of deep of um, GVMs for that for that vehicle. And I guess you could potentially just use the other one, but it would still need to go through that. So everything everything's got to go through the process, right? It's just how quick and easy that process is. So if it is a case of re-rating, let's say, one Ranger to a different Ranger's GVM, that would be quick and simple. But if you wanted to take, let's say, 200 series and increase its GVM by 40%, that would not be simple or, or easy. So it's all yeah. the process, just how difficult it is. Is that is that fair? That, that, that's pretty fair um, analogy for that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's spot on there. The um, you, You've got to remember, though, that even though they're sister vehicles and they're developed off the same platform, they're not identical. So this would be something that they might have different, I don't know, um, intake apertures at the front of the vehicle. So the aerodynamics might be slightly different than the airflow and the, and the HVAC uh, systems in there. So again, this is the job of the approved person engineer. He'll look at these type of things and be able to pull out the pertinent pieces of information to say that, yes, this is okay to do that because of this and this reason. And I validated through this and this process. So yeah, going through the process uh, should be simpler in these types of uh, scenarios. Uh, but as I said before, this is the job of the engineer to do it it's themselves. Yeah, okay. Now, another common question, it's tangential to this, but comes up is the use of rated shackles for towing. And having had a look at the legislation in several different states is, of course, slightly different. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that if you use a one-ton rated shackle, and that's to AS2741, then that gives you a braking strength of at least um, six tonnes, six times the rating, and that complies with the requirement for the um, shackle to be one and a half times the trailer's ATM if it's three and a half tonnes. So then you should be good to go, um, in Queensland at least, and as far as I can see for, for other states. Yes, that's exactly correct. Yeah, there, there's you, you, you've summed it up perfectly. There's not, nothing I can add to that. That's perfect. Okay, that's good. But I, I just yeah. I <laughs> say those things again. I, I, I need TMR to say it because I can say these things from blue in the face and they go, oh, who are you? But, yeah, it's, it's nice yeah. to get that confirmation. Yeah. Thank you. No, that, and that's the way we interpret it as well. So, uh, that, And that's why we document those within our codes uh, yeah. accordingly. Yeah, okay, great. Now, is there anything else which you would like to say to the great public of Australia on this subject. Now is your chance to broadcast TMR's official message to help clear up some of the fog of confusion around laws. I, mean, um, I, I think the, the, just the one thing that I would like to get across is that if you're struggling or if you're stuck, get in touch with us. Uh, the, you People can contact us through our TMR website or Whole of Gov website. Um, we, we have a great section within the Vehicle Standards Unit at Transport and Main Roads with a lot of knowledgeable people. Um, we're on, we're there five days a week ready to take any questions. Uh, if you want us to give you a call back, just give us your number and we'll call you back. There's an email address as well, which is on the website, or you can contact us through a web inquiry on our website and that gets routed to us and we get those responses back quickly. So like I say, if you're struggling and you need some assistance, we're more than happy to help. And like you say, clear up these questions because there are a lot of uh, questions out there that um, many people might not know the answer to or they hear the stories around the campfire. But, yeah, we can give you what the legislation states and what you are, can and basically can't do when it comes to modifications. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really good because the legislation is is there, but um, I had trouble interpreting some parts of it. So thank you for taking the time, Dan. Um, if I have trouble, I'm fair to say that other people of a less technical bent would also struggle as well. So it's good to have that clarification. Uh, it's, our, it's our pleasure. And, and, you know, that's what we're paid to do. We're here to help. Yeah. Great. Well, Adam, thank you very much, Need, for taking the time um, to talk to us. And hopefully, um, for, I'm sure this will definitely clear up a lot of um, confusion here and help people get their vehicles modified to be fit for purpose, whatever that purpose may be. Uh, thanks for hosting me, Robert. Um, and, yeah, no doubt we'll speak soon.